Hello and welcome to my official 2023 year in review. In this video, we're gonna be going through every single update of the previous year in RuneScape month over month, and I'm gonna be rating every single update of the year on a scale from one to five. And then at the end, I'm gonna give you my picks for the best and the worst updates of the year. With that said, let's get into it. I am super excited for this one. Starting off in January, the first update of the year was an absolute banger, with the death costs and grant exchange tax being introduced. And although a 2% tax doesn't sound like an absolute positive and something I should be applauding, pushing the onus of the economy from people trying to learn how to PVM and moving that onto and towards just about anybody who plays the game fairly evenly is an absolute win in my books. But far more importantly than that, death costs. Death costs were becoming a huge issue, sometimes costing upwards of 20 million coins for a singular death. And that stopped a lot of people from getting into PVMing. And as you'll see as we go further into the year, this was an absolutely essential update that made a huge difference in carving the path for the rest of the year. So to me, the death cost and GE tax update gets an absolute five out of five. It was a long time coming and I'm so glad it's part of the game. But there was one other thing that happened when they changed death costs, which is that the ring of death became obsolete because you can't use it to skip death costs now that they've been reduced. And because of that, we got this. This thing was an absolute cheat code. And although it was only in the game for about two weeks, the super buffed Ring of Death was an awesome era from this year. And this thing just went so incredibly hard. It basically let you trivialize and tank every single mechanic in the game. And I had a really fun time messing around with it. That being said, of course, with a little bit of foresight, it probably is an update that didn't need to come into the game at all, because almost immediately from it being introduced, people were abusing it pretty much everywhere. So for me, the super buffed Ring of Death, although it only lasted in the game for a couple weeks, it gets a two and a half out of five. Later on in January, there were two other updates, and the first was Raptor's Rampage. Raptor's Rampage was a really interesting one because they did something different that they'd never done before which was it allowed you to do one boss kill every single day where you'd get triple drops. And this was an extremely interesting idea. It's something they hadn't played around with before, and I think it was very well liked. Because with the Raptor's Rampage buff, the longer the boss fight you did, the more you stood to gain. And although it maybe wasn't the most stonks thing in the universe for the price of the Zuck gear, Nani? it was an awesome way to get people into PVMing, and this is the kind of promo event that I'd be very open to see them running again in the future. For me, it gets a solid three and a half out of five. They tried out something new, and as far as I can tell, I think it worked. The last and final update in January was the beta for the Jagex launcher. And although a lot of people don't love the Jagex launcher, I'm just gonna say one thing that explains why it was such an important change and a really large update. Prior to this, RuneScape didn't do capital letters in their passwords. And you might be typing out, wait, no, Ryan, I had capital letters in my password. You may have set a password with capital letters, but I guarantee you, if you had typed it in lowercase without any of them or any of the special characters, it would have still logged you in. We needed a system overhaul desperately, and the Jagex Launcher provides that. And plus, if you're someone that likes to play on 800 accounts at a time, first off, I have no idea how you do that, and that's crazy. And second off, well, now you have an easier time. And I certainly like not having to type in my username and password every time I want to log in, and cycling between accounts with a click of a button, it's just a solid update overall, and I'm really glad it was added into the game. I'm giving the Jagex Launcher beta a solid four out of five. Heading into February, things started off with a quest, and it's the Fort Farin 3 introduction called New Foundations. And this introduced four new buildings into the fort. We got the chapel, the command center, the town hall, and the workshop. And although my thoughts on the fort now have changed ever so slightly from where they're at now, this was actually a pretty solid introduction. All four buildings offered something unique and interesting, and I liked the idea of a place where people could skill and play the game together. The worlds were starting to feel a little barren, and the fort to me really made the game feel a little bit more like an MMO. You actually got to interact with other players, which I thought was a really nice thing that had been missing. It's kind of like a PVM hub, but for skilling. The workshop provided a nice place to train your smithing, and it also allowed you to check on your invention machines, and it gave you a little bit of extra power as well, which is overall pretty beneficial. The chapel was solid for prayer training, and it's the best spot to do that. And then we get in to the command center, which is a personal favorite of mine, because it allows you to check on a number of things like miscellanea and player on ports, all from one handy location. This was a really big quality of life. It was something that a lot of people really liked, and I'm absolutely on the team that this was a solid building. 
The last building was the Town Hall, which introduced something called Rest XP, which effectively rewards bonus XP for not playing the game, which is something that a lot of other MMOs do, and to me, this was implemented pretty well. So overall, for the new Foundations quest and the introduction of the fort, we got a good looking area, we got some interesting buildings that actually had some good uses. So to me, the introduction of the fort is getting a solid four out of five. The one other notable update in February was the lighting improvements to a number of boss areas done by Mod Black Witch and the rest of her team. And these were absolutely awesome. I'll show you the before, and then I'll show you the after of the Raksha Arena. It looks less contrasty, it's easier to see, it's brighter, and it overall just looks better. And this was a notable update because this kind of spurred an entire year of massive graphical updates that we'll talk about as we get to them month over month. But to me, this was a solid five out of five. Any update that makes the game look and feel and play better is awesome in my books. Next up, we're heading into March, where they removed the wilderness threat system that they'd implemented not even a year earlier. And this was a bit of a tough one for me. I'm glad they removed the system because the system didn't work, but it's one of those ones where in hindsight, the way that the system had been designed was never really gonna work. It never worked for any amount of time. And this was kind of them cutting their losses and moving on. So now we're left with a kind of weird wilderness that is completely safe. And it's kind of a Slayer hub more than anything else. The removal of the system was good, but it also kind of feels like dev time to remove something that they'd previously spent dev time making. And I wonder if there could have been improvements made to it that wouldn't have costed a lot of time and would have resulted in a slightly better wilderness now. Overall though, the removal of the system that nobody liked, I'll give it a solid three out of five. And now for the first extremely sketchy update of the year, we've got the Murder at the Border quest. And I had no issues with this quest at all. It felt kind of like an old runescape -y Sinclair Mansion style murder mystery. But I have one massive issue with the primary reward from the quest, which was, of course, the kitchen. You might be thinking, what's wrong with the kitchen? To which I would say, one absolutely glaring thing that makes this update a one out of five in my book, which is that the reward you get for the kitchen doesn't make any sense at all. The tier one reward is a boost to slashing spider webs for some reason. The tier two gives you a slightly better burn chance. And then we get to the tier three, where you get a 5% increased XP boost while you're cooking in the kitchen, you've got access to a range. So you'd think, okay, what's wrong with that? It seems like a good place to do your cooking. And you would be absolutely incorrect because I see you looking at that range in the kitchen. And if you use it, you are absolutely scamming yourself because here's the deal. There's an XP boost for cooking in the kitchen. And there's also an XP boost for cooking on a fire. And because both of these XP boosts stack, the meta for cooking in the kitchen is to light a fire on the floor in the kitchen and cook on the fire on the floor in the kitchen instead of using the range that is right next to you. The final notable update in March was once again another awesome update from Mod Black Witch & Co where we got a bunch of dungeon lighting improvements. They took some of the darkest, oldest, outdated looking areas in the game and gave them a fresh look of paint. And for the most part, I think they look significantly better. So I'm gonna give this update a four out of five. I do still think some of the new textures look a little bit like clay, but at the end of the day, it doesn't look 20 years old anymore, and that is a positive. In April, we're going to continue with the theme of the fort, and we're going to start things off with unwelcome guests and the addition of the guardhouse. I thought the quest itself was fine, and the Slayer guardhouse perks are decent. If you're someone that's already doing Slayer, they're nice to have and they're handy. But I absolutely took issue with the mobs that were released, and in particular, the rewards. Armored phantoms are extremely difficult to kill. They're a very high level Slayer mob, and the thing that they drop that was introduced in this update is Greater Sonic Wave. Greater Sonic Wave is a really interesting one because I purchased this on the release day and in the nine months since, I can honestly say, hand on heart, I don't believe I have used it a single time. This ability was pretty much dead on arrival, especially because on the exact same day that they released Greater Sonic Wave, they also tied the cooldown of G-Sonic to Greater Concentrated Blast, which means if you use one, they both go on cooldown. Greater Concentrated Blast is one of the most foundational abilities to magic, so of course, there's no actual good point to use this in any scenario. The main thing that it does is improve your hit chance, but Jagex is already moving away from splashing and hit chance to begin with. So not only does this not do very much now, but I would suspect that in the future, this thing gets worse and worse and worse over time. So if it wasn't already obsolete, it will be in a little bit. 
In a year where they made so many changes to combat to make things make a little more sense, make things more intuitive, and also update abilities to make sure that anything that you click kind of makes sense or kind of does an okay thing, this is an absolute step in the wrong direction. And overall, although the guardhouse was absolutely better than the kitchen, I'm gonna give it a two and a half out of five. Heading into May, we had another set of graphical overhauls, this time dealing with a lot of areas on the overworld, and I'll show some of them behind me as we go along here. My favorite one by far though was Birthorp, and when you compare them side to side, it is no contest. The new Birthorp looks so much better, and it's actually one of the places that I like to spend time and hang out now because of how nice that lighting is and that sky is. So great work to Mod Black Witch again, and this update is gonna get another five out of five. It's awesome to see how much progress they were able to make in such a short time and how big of an impact that has for anyone logging into the game and thinking, oh, this doesn't look like it's 20 years old anymore, in the best way possible. May was also the introduction of the Golden Cape Hunt, and I don't feel like this went particularly well. It was basically a clone of the Golden Party Hat event, but the Golden Party Hat was pretty sought after because it was an opportunity to get a party hat. And for a lot of players, this would be the first and only time they'd really have an opportunity to get one. So a lot of people grinded really hard to get them. As for the cape, it's already the busiest slot in the entire game. There are so many other capes that someone would prefer to wear over the golden cape, and I'm not sure I've seen a single player unironically wear one of these after the end of the event. But there were two things that came with this event that were pretty interesting. The first was the porter buff, where we got unlimited porters for the first time ever, and this completely changed the game for a lot of players. This is a reward we've already had back once since, because it clearly got so many people hooked on training skills. Whether or not it should have been allowed on Iron Man is a discussion for another day, but this absolutely had a large impact on the game. The second thing that came out with this Golden Cape Hunt was it was the first time where we were actually given keepsake keys without having to spend rune coins. So I thought that was a pretty cool addition, and I'm definitely glad they did that and would love to see more of that in the future, because you should not need to spend a ton of GP or your credit card to look good in RuneScape. For the Golden Cape event, I'm going to give it a 2 out of 5. June started off with an absolute banger, which is of course the max cash limit increase. This took the max cash stack from just over 2 billion to effectively an infinite number. And before you type that it's not actually infinite, there is more GP in the new max cash limit than has ever been generated in the game in its history. So even if you're able to hack every single account that has ever been created, take every single piece of gold, you would still be far below the limit. Not only was I shocked that there were no massive bugs associated with this and it didn't break the game, but it's also a good piece of future proofing because even in 10 years time or 20 years time, if RuneScape is still kicking it, they're still not gonna have to worry about upping that max cash limit anytime soon. For me, the max cash limit update gets a five out of five. After the max cash limit increase, we got the fractured Staff of Armadal rebalance. And this one was pretty controversial. Overall, I think what they did to the Fractured Staff of Armadal was fine. They made it a lot more consistent than it was before, but that also did take the fun away from it just a little bit. And at the time, I was extremely gung-ho about the rebalance. And after the fact, I will say, I have used magic a lot less since then, and that's not just because of necromancy. Although the changes were overall good and the logic made sense, it did make the weapon a little bit less fun to use, and I think that should dock it. So for me, I'm gonna give it the Fractured Staff of Armadal rebalance, a three out of five. June was a pretty action-packed month because after the Fractured Staff of Armadal rebalance, we also got the introduction of the Woodcutter's Grove. And I really liked this addition to the fort after an extremely lackluster kitchen that once again, didn't make a whole lot of sense and the guardhouse that was just okay to me. The Woodcutter's Grove I thought was fantastic. It's a beautiful area, it looks nice, and they also managed to turn this into pretty much a full-scale woodcutting rework. They added a bunch of new rewards, including a best-in-slot hatchet, they changed a bunch of XP rates, and overall, they managed to pack in a ton of content into this update. And although I think the Imkando Axe takes a little bit too long to get, overall, this was a great way to implement something into the fort and something I would have loved to see with some of the future implementations to the fort, where instead of just adding a building that may or may not do something useful, they actually take that as an opportunity to make some changes to the skill that are absolutely needed. I will happily give the Woodcutter's Grove a four out of five, and I think of all of the fort expansions, it was by far the best one. Speaking of fort updates that may or may not make sense, in July, we've got the Dead and Buried quest. And this quest was extremely controversial for a number of reasons. First off, there was the raptor reveal, and I think for a lot of players, having this raptor be revealed as a person in itself 
wasn't negative. I think a lot of people liked the idea of not knowing who it was or speculating on who it could have been. And revealing that absolutely took away a little bit of the mystery and allure of the character. I did agree with some of the criticisms on the storytelling techniques that were used in this quest. When you play through this quest, it feels a little bit rushed. You get a very quick exposition into the raptor's tragic backstory, and to me there wasn't enough time or enough buildup to really truly care about the character. So when I got to the epic twist at the end of this quest, I felt just about nothing about it. And for me, that was something where I wish they could have taken more time and built into the storyline a little bit more. It is worth noting that the quest looked quite nice and the puzzles were fun, but overall for me, the Dead and Buried quest gets a 2 out of 5 and it has nothing to do with the identity of who the raptor ended up being. As a reward for the Dead and Buried quest, we also got access to the ranger's workroom. Yet another room getting absolutely packed in to the fort. And although the tier 1 and tier 2 buffs are good, if you're still training Fletching like it's 2006, I did have a gripe about the tier 3 Anima Flow buff because at this point in time, there were a ton of complaints and a ton of issues with the upkeep of Dine Arrows. And to me, the Ranger's workroom was a perfect opportunity to work on some of these upkeep issues and make it significantly easier to get these arrows. And instead, what the flow of Anima buff did is it gave you an option to make the arrows themselves faster in exchange for less XP. This was so close to a solid fix, but the problem is this. The issue with making Dine Arrows wasn't the final step of putting everything together, it was the time it takes to actually gather the raw materials. So what they could have done instead, that I think would have been a lot more impactful and a lot more useful, would have been to offer the same sort of trade-off, but instead of making the arrows themselves faster, what if they increased your output in exchange for less experience? To me, the Ranger's workroom gets a 1.5 out of 5. It is down there with the kitchen for me. August saw one of the largest updates in RuneScape history. No, not that one. <laughs> Necromancy was released, and Necromancy was absolutely awesome. It was packed full of content, with a ton of quests, a brand new combat style, and it completely overhauled and changed the way that the game is played. And especially for new and returning players, Necromancy was a smash hit out of the park. The devs mentioned before the release that this was a huge risk for them to take, and that if it didn't go well, they had no idea what was going to happen to combat and RuneScape moving forward. The theory was, if we make these changes, we add visual clarity, we make it fun to use, we make it intuitive, players will play it. With so many players coming back to the game and trying out combat in RuneScape for the first time, at a significant level of success too. From an accessibility standpoint, Necromancy was an absolute smash hit, and from that standpoint, I'd give it a 5 out of 5. But that doesn't totally paint the entire picture. Because now, there's a bit of an issue with Necromancy, which is that for existing players, once you've got the Necromancy gear, any other progression you could make into any of the other styles feels kind of pointless, because Necromancy is a little overtuned and it's pretty much the best combat style and the easiest combat style everywhere in the game. And in hindsight, I think if they could have come through with some other combat changes to the other existing styles that came out alongside of Necromancy, I think you could have avoided this problem, coming out with something that is absolutely perfect for new players and also doesn't ruffle the feathers of your existing players either. Alongside of Necromancy though, we also had two bosses, Hermod and Raziel. I'm not going to comment on Hermod because it's a bit of a lower level boss. Let's talk about Raziel. Because Raziel dropped seven different pieces of tier 95 Necromancy gear, which makes it a pretty important boss release throughout the year. As for its intended purpose, as a boss at the end of the Necromancy storyline and a nice introduction into PVMing in RuneScape, I think it was solid. And for those newer players, I think it was great. But a lot of players found him to be a DPS dummy. And initially, upon the release of Necromancy, I just thought that was because I was in an echo chamber of experienced PVMers who were bored of the boss. But then, if you get into the drop mechanics, I don't see how anybody could go this dry on a pair of gloves and not want to absolutely quit the game and rip their hair out and also feel like it's a complete DPS dummy. So to me, although the Raziel boss itself I thought was cool and was the correct difficulty level, the loot mechanics leave a lot to be desired. And the fact that there was no kind of bad luck mitigation at all has led to a lot of players giving up on the boss and in turn giving up on PVM. Because this was supposed to be the boss that introduced everyone else into the rest of PVM in RuneScape. And because of that, a lot of people gave up on Raziel and it's unfortunate because with some changes to the drop system and some form of bad luck mitigation, I think a lot of players could have had a way better experience with it. So for me, Raziel's gonna get a three. Next up on the chopping block, we have, of course, September's infamous Hero Pass. And I will say, I don't think the Hero Pass 
in itself was bad. The specifics of it weren't significantly worse than a Yak Track. And the gameplay buffs that everyone in the community was very worried about and upset about weren't terribly egregious as they were, but they did set a spooky precedent that rightfully got a lot of members of the community upset. But the thing that makes the Hero Pass by far one of the worst updates I think I've ever experienced or seen in my 18 years playing this game is the timing. We just had the Necromancy launch. So many players were incredibly excited to be playing the game. They were back, everyone was grinding, everyone was having fun. And then right when it would have been the perfect time to follow up with something like a Raptor event to get more people PVMing, or a free death event, or do something about auras, or push through something with the combat beta, we instead got the Hero Pass. The messaging around it didn't make any sense. They said they were removing Daily Scape to avoid FOMO. But at the same time, the Hero Pass, if I remind you, looked like this. I just think it's, it's really, really good that there's no, no pressure to log in every... I only have five hours to do all this? Oh God, we gotta log in every day! And at the end of the day, with a community that was already a little burnt out from necromancy, this for a lot of players was the straw that broke the camel's back. As a content creator, RuneScape 3 lost about half of their audience, as well as half of their creators, along with this update. And we've been slowly trying to rebuild since then. But beyond the content creator point of view, this was a stark reminder that no matter how great things go, there will always be a negative side and a dark side to playing an MMO like RuneScape. The timing and the communication around the Hero Pass was, quite frankly, just awful. Nothing about it was good, and I'm glad to see that at very least, after a month of changes and a month of back and forth with the community, they did decide to pull it. So although I'm giving the Hero Pass a resounding negative four hero points out of five, I will say this was a big moment for the community because everyone in the community banded together to say that we didn't want this thing. We pushed and we pushed and we pushed, and the community management team also relayed that information and translated it in a way that the higher ups would hear. And because of that, about a month later, the hero pass was gone. They apologized, they promised to remove it, and they promised that it wouldn't be back. So although the story starts extremely negatively, and although the damage was already done with regard to a lot of players quitting and switching to other games, the end result of the Hero Pass was a reminder that this community still has a lot of power and a lot of pull. As long as we unite together and we work together, we have a strong voice and we can get a lot done. After a very tumultuous September, heading into October, we got the Ancient Awakening quest. And I actually quite enjoyed this one. I thought it was cool to see Ungeal for the first time. We got a lot of good solid lore exposition and we also got to see a preview of the finale of Fort Ferinthry and the Vorkath attack. Ancient Awakening for me gets a solid three out of five. It was a solid quest. But along with it, we also got the Botanist Workbench. And this kind of follows the same tune and the same issue I had with both the Kitchen and the Fletching Station, which is that they took something that is problematic in the community that people don't like, and then instead of fixing it, they fixed something kind of adjacent to it that really wasn't a problem at all. The main benefit of the Tier 3 Botanist Workbench is the ability to make overloads in batches. You can make them a full invent at a time. And you might be thinking, well, that's great, isn't it? Isn't it nice to not have to bank every three or four potions you make? And to that I would say, yeah, absolutely. But that isn't even the 10th worst part about making overloads. The majority of players don't like making overloads because you've got to take your extremes, each of them, make them into overloads. And then you've got to make those overloads into supreme overloads. You've got to then make those supreme overloads into elder overloads. And then you have to turn that elder overload into a cell. The issue wasn't how AFK it was. For the most part, it was the amount of steps required. And to me, it would have been way cooler and way better if they'd just made base overloads tradable. If they'd done that, there's one less barrier to entry for PVMing, there's still incentive to train Herb Lore because all of the other overloads and the best adrenaline potions in the game come from the Herb Lore skill, and then you've actually reduced the amount of steps it takes to make overloads by one, because you could then buy your overloads if you're just someone that wants to PVM. So to me, this was another missed opportunity, and I'm gonna give the Botanist Workbench a solid two out of five. Heading into November, we're starting things off with Vorgath. And I already know in the comments, this is gonna be an extremely controversial one because a lot of players have a love-hate relationship with Vorgath. To me, we'll start with the quest. It was a bit of a fast finale. For the finale of this entire Fort series that we've been working towards for the entire year, it just felt like it went by pretty quick. But there was also an actual real cutscene of Vorkath destroying the fort, and I absolutely appreciated that. Because if instead of a cutscene, you'd given me a PowerPoint presentation of it happening, I would have been a little miffed. 
Normal with Workath came out pretty much perfect. It had some good drops, the GP per hour was solid. If you wanted to go faster and get skips, that was put in the game intentionally, and you could fight the boss with teams of one to 10 players. So to me, normal mode was honestly great. It didn't feel terribly unbalanced. It didn't feel too hard for the rewards, but then we get the hard mode. But by far the most frustrating part of it is the loot. There is no chase drop in hard mode of Warcath. The Lord of Bones incantation is extremely niche, and you could also get it from normal mode. And for hard mode, it's actually a pretty decently hard boss. You take an absolute ton of damage. And to me, putting it out without any kind of chase drop that would incentivize going there absolutely makes me like the boss a lot less and makes me enjoy it significantly less as well. It just doesn't really feel like there's much point. The brand new loot system where you effectively get a clue scroll is extremely cool, but once again, imagine if you were stacking elite clues, but the elite clues couldn't drop dies. Kind of feels like that a little bit, where it's a really cool system, but it would have worked better at a different boss, a future boss that had some more chase drops. The last thing I'm gonna mention is that on release, the hard mode loot was absolutely terrible, but by the end of release week, they more than tripled the value of it, so the GB per hour at the boss is actually completely fine. It's just that the things that it drops don't really feel befitting of a boss of that difficulty level. And for that reason, I'm gonna give Warcath a two and a half out of five. There's a lot of positive about it, but a lot of negative too. And hopefully they can make some changes to it in the coming months to make it a much more pleasant experience. The final update in November, and yes, this was November and not December, is the Christmas Village. And this, I will confidently say, hand on heart, is the best holiday event I have ever played in my 18 years playing RuneScape. This event absolutely blew my mind, and here's why. The reality of playing an MMO in 2023 is there's gonna be microtransactions. There kind of has to be. But they managed to make the bulk of this event completely separate from it. They re-released the Black Party hat, but instead of being a wheel spin or like the Halloween event where it's basically a glorified treasure hunter promo, they actually built this super fun, awesome event every single Sunday, where Santa actually comes to his grotto, you get to talk to him, you get to celebrate with a bunch of other players, do present drops, do broadcasts, and you have this awesome, beautiful Christmas-themed skilling hub. The Christmas Village came out with an awesome quest where you got to decorate a number of cities around Gilinor, and to me, unlike many other events where I usually just skip them, I enjoyed this, and every single Sunday, I enjoy spending hours just hanging out with other players in the Christmas Village, waiting for Santa to arrive. Although the odds of getting a black party hat are extremely slim, all the cosmetics and the outfits that everybody gets look absolutely awesome. And the fact that they managed to come out with a quest, allowed us to decorate and get into the festive spirit, added a bunch of different ways to get your nice points that are also extremely quick to do and don't require you to log in every single day because you can make up for them whenever you want to. They also added in a skilling hub, all these present drops, and of course, the black party hat, and none of those things are influenced whatsoever by any form of microtransactions. And although this also came out with a wrapping paper event, of course, as was expected, the wrapping paper event felt separate to the Christmas Village in a really important, meaningful way. So to me, this gets a five out of five. As far as holiday events go in MMOs in 2023, this gave me an absolute ton of hope for the future, and I genuinely hope to see the Christmas Village back again in 2024. Overall, this year had some crazy ups and downs. We started off really strong with death costs and the Grand Exchange Tax. We got Raptors Rampage, we got the Jagex Launcher, and then even the launch of the fort, I would argue, was extremely cool. But then there was this huge lull right before Necromancy, where things didn't seem to be coming out quite as polished. Necromancy came out with a bang and was an absolutely massive high. I would say probably the most excited I've ever been as a RuneScape player in my 18 years playing. But then it was followed up by the Hero Pass. No year in RuneScape is ever gonna be perfect. There are gonna be updates that are great and updates that were terrible. And there was absolutely a lot of both of those this year. But to end things off with some new outfits, a cool holiday event, and the announcement that RuneFest is coming back in September 2024 has me extremely excited for the next year to come. Last but not least, I'm gonna award my best and my worst updates of the year. My worst update of the year, of course, is gonna be the Hero Pass. The impact that had on the game is second to just about nothing I've seen since the evolution of combat itself. And for my best update of the year, you might be thinking I'm gonna say Necromancy, but there are some issues with Necromancy now for an existing endgame player. And I think because of that, it's not an update that everybody is happy about. But one update that I think made a lot of people happy and even made Necromancy possible as a skill to release is the very first update of the year that impacted death costs and the grant exchange tax. 
The reduction in death costs enabled so many new players to get into PVMing in the game and be able to have fun playing without having to stress. And even for me personally, as an endgame player, I'm a lot happier playing the game now, knowing that I don't lose an hour of work every time I die. So, with that said, that is my final roundup and my final review and recap of the 2023 year in RuneScape. But I have a question for you guys. What was your favorite update and why? Let me know in the comments down below and I cannot wait to see you in the next video where I'm going to be going through every update that I want to see in 2024.